You know, it's, uh, I got a deja vu when I came here today, and I have Rob McEwen sitting beside me. Because I remember very well, probably 10, 12 years ago, that Rob McEwen and I used to come down here and try to get people interested in the gold market. And it was very tough sledding at the time. And this would be like 2000, 2001. And I have said many, many times, and maybe I've never said it to Rob, but uh, there were two people that impressed me at the time of all the gold CEOs that I knew. And one was Todd Bruce, who was with I Am Gold, and one was Rob McEwen, who was with Gold Corp. And they were religious and uh, very foresightful about the true reason for owning gold. And I know Rob has made a wonderful contribution. He's a tremendous visionary, and you're going to look forward to uh, hearing him speak, because he is truly a class guy in the gold business, and I'm happy to share the podium with him. Normally, if I'd be sharing the podium with him, he'd be the keynote speaker, but <laughs> you'll be blessed to uh, hear his comments. Uh, the other little anecdote that I'd like to tell about uh, Rob McEwen, and I don't think I've said this to Rob either, but I remember he, he always wrote these rather uh, interesting annual reports and I'm not sure whether it was the 99 annual report or the 98 annual report. And they said that um, the, uh, the gold uh, up at Red Lake was uh, 1.5 ounces per ton. But uncut, it could have been something like 2.1 or 2.2. I don't forget the exact number. So I thought, well, gee, that's a pretty big difference because, of course, all that extra gold is profit. And if all the analysts are using 1.5 and it's actually... 2.1 or 2.2, they're going to earn twice as much as everyone thinks. So I made a point of going over to see Rob and his uh, geologist, and I kind of came away with the impression that, gee, I think that 2.1 ounces per gold would be pretty good. I started buying the stock, and I was a little criticized at the time. Um, and one of the criticisms was, what, how the hell can you buy a, a company with Rob McEwen running? He's been so tough in the union. He's a really tough guy to get along with all these complaints, I said, well, you know, it looks like a pretty good ore body, and I think I'll get in there and buy it. And normally, I don't tell you the name of the company ahead of time, but yeah, this was Gold Corp, which was under 500 million of market cap. Two years later, Rob McEwen was mining man of the year, and I don't even know the market cap of Gold Corp today, but it's, I don't know, 20 billion or 30 billion. And it's a bit of a testament to um, what is interesting in the gold area, that if you can find, you know, this uh, diamond in the rough, uh, even with someone like Rob McEwen almost begging you to come and look at his company, because he puts it in his annual report, what he really thinks is there. And sure enough, <clears throat> everything that Rob said was true. In fact, the grade was above 2.1, as it turned out. And of course, it's the Red Lake ore body, which is one of the fanciest and greatest high-grade ore bodies uh, in the world. Now, um, I don't always stick to the script. I got a bunch of uh, slides here, but I don't always go to them, okay? I'll forewarn you, because I just like blabbing about things. Uh, but the title of my speech is Mania Manipulation Meltdown. I've spoken about this topic many times. And it starts from the mania part, which was in uh, 2000 when the NASDAQ hit 5,000 and everyone was paying 200 uh, times sales for companies and it was totally ridiculous and we kind of recognized it as the top of the market and we're likely to go into a bear market. And then the manipulation part is the part where the forces that be, which today I call the central planners. I know it's a demeaning comment, but I mean it that way. The central planners are the governments, the central banks, all those guys who are trying to prevent what naturally should happen from happening. And so we get, um, we had new home buyer tax credit, we got cash for clunkers, we got new jobs programs, we got TARPs, we got tel uh, TELFs, we got QE1s, QE2s, TWIS, LTROs in Europe, the OMT in Europe now. We got conservatorships. We had more damn things that you will never have read in your Economics 101 textbook, all in order to try to prevent what naturally should happen in an economy, what naturally should happen from happening. So here we are today, 
uh, 12, 13 years later since the peak in the NASDAQ. And the market's kind of hanging in there. And um, we have absolutely blown out the balance sheets, if you will, of governments, the balance sheet of the ECB, the balance sheet of the Fed, the balance sheet of the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England. Everyone's put all this effort into holding things together. And I ask you to reflect on, just imagine you're in Europe today. You think of all the efforts that have been made to keep the world together, and where are you now? You're in a recession. You've accomplished nothing. China's probably going into a recession. The U.S. is probably in a recession. Think of all the things that have been done here to try to hold it together. And I can guarantee you it won't work. And why won't it work? Because the 99% have a terrible, terrible time trying to survive in a highly inflationary environment vis-a-vis -vis what they're told. In other words, you all know that inflation is not 2%. But wage increases are 2% or less if you have a job and if you keep a job. And we have cohorts. I think I should move this mic down a little. I don't want to make that much noise. Um, we have a cohort coming into the workforce that is having a Oh, maybe I should move it down that far. Okay, that's having a terribly difficult time. I'll cite one example to you. Now, th these aren't the type of people we're going to feel bad for, okay? But there's a data point that came out that 2011 law graduates, when they joined law firms, had a starting salary of $85,000. A year before it was $104,000. A year before that it was $130,000. And that's what's happening to the graduating youth. If they get a job, they get a low paying job. They get a job where there aren't big wage increases. And I look at the age of this crowd, and when you went for a job, there were lots of opportunities, and the wage increases initially were abundant. And the people coming into the workforce, and some of you would either be parents of them or know these people, they're not having an easy time of it. So generally the big p picture is, is incredibly weak. Um, I ask you to watch the releases from the corporations when FedEx says things are tough, Intel says things are tough, um, Norfolk Southern says things are tough. I mean, we just get one weak report after another. And do not listen to the government that tells you that they created 800,000 jobs uh, last month, because I absolutely 100% percent convinced it's total BS, okay? It's, it's just to get the unemployment rate down below eight so that somebody can win an election. But you would have to be massively naive to think that all of a sudden 800,000 jobs have been created last month. But that's the way the statistics come out. And the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has an awful history, awful history of revising all the numbers later. In fact, they almost always revise the unemployment claims from the previous week upwards, as they did this week, and as they've done for probably 39 of the last 40 weeks. So they're not to be relied upon. And why are we in this <clears throat> very, very difficult economic time? Because the banks were over levered. And when you're levered at 20 to 1, you have five cents of capital supporting a dollar of assets. And when those dollars of assets fall by 5%, you have no capital. 5%. So what happened? We found that um, some of these companies couldn't make it. So we ended up with uh, liquidation in Lehman Brothers. And when Lehman Brothers was liquidated, we all found out what the real values were and what the domino impact was going to be. And I remind you that at the time it was stated that the markets were within hours of not opening, including the banks. Never forget it. And then along comes TARP, saves the day, and then all the other programs follow. And ever since the Lehman liquidation, there's never been another liquidation. Everyone gets bailed out. Fannie, Freddie, AIG, GM, 
essentially Citigroup, our Royal Bank of Scotland, the Irish banks, the Spanish banks, the Greek banks, the Greek government. It goes on and on and on and on. Because nobody can stand to see a liquidation because we'll find out who's wearing the clothes and who's not wearing the clothes. And you'd hate to see the domino effect. I mean, they won't even let Greece go down for fear that it takes the economic system down. That's a very small country. Lehman Brothers wasn't even big and nearly took everything down. But there's never been a liquidation event. And uh, for those of you who live in this country, I happen to be Canadian, um, I would uh, ask you to, every Friday night, they announce the bank failures here in the United States. And they're always come out about six o'clock as everyone that joined the happy hour and not even looking at the information. But the information is as follows all the time. Let's just imagine that the bank's assets were X. Or let's say 20X, it'll make it easier. That means they had one X of capital and 20X of assets. You're broke, you lost the one X, okay? Otherwise the FDIC wouldn't be taking you over. Then the FDIC tells us how much they had to pay to the acquiring bank to get the acquiring bank to buy the failed bank. And on average, they have to pay the acquiring bank 5X to take over the failed bank. Simple mathematics, the bank had lost their capital six times over. Nowhere near solvent. And I think the reason you don't see many, as many bank failures, I don't think the FDIC has time to deal with them all and figure out what the proper value is that the acquiring bank should, should pay. It's a hell of a process. You've got to go through every loan and every bank and negotiate with somebody to buy it. And he's kind of pressing you for probably a, a small number. But there have got to be all sorts of banks that are in trouble in this country. And of course, they're never forced to, to liquidate because we don't allow liquidation anymore. OK, I hope I've depressed you enough. Uh, OK, this is how I skip, skip through these things, OK? Uh, OK, I want, uh, this is maybe worth The Dow transports are not confirming the industrials. The transports which represent the real economy have a huge divergence from the industrials. And it's, it's in the Dow theory, if the Dow transports don't confirm the financials, you could be very well heading for a bear market. And they're certainly not confirming it. All the economically sensitive stocks that produce real things are weak. Uh, here's the recovery. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you get them all the time. What the Bank of America, didn't they announce they're going to lay off 30,000 people? And uh, Cummins Engine just announced 1,500 people yesterday. I can tell you, the easiest call of all in my mind is, do you think Caterpillar is going to do well? Come on. Equipment lasts for 20 years. China stopped building. We're going to Europe's going to stop building. We're not going to need any more Caterpillar goddamn equipment. We'll have more equipment sitting around doing nothing than you can imagine. Same with Cummins engines. The um, truck sales in, in China are down something like 24% year over year. 24. Okay, oh, there we are. Okay, fine. We don't need to deal with that. The Pen Purchasing Manufacturers Index. Okay. Now, the reason I really wanted to come here is to talk about gold and silver. You have a number of uh, companies presenting tonight, including Q and Gold. And we want to talk about what's going on in the gold market. And I just wrote an article that was called, Do the Central Banks Have Any Gold Left? And if anybody wants to go to see that article, just go to sprott.com and that article will, will be available. But we have a thing going on in the world where many, many non-Western banks, central banks, are buying gold. And we have some of them listed here. In fact, I think I just read that India bought 33 tons of gold in the month of September. Now, 33 doesn't mean anything to you, but I want to give you a starting point here. Remember the number 4,000. That's the number of tons, gold, uh, tons of gold produced in a year, okay? 4,000, don't forget the number, okay? Because it'll be very relevant to, I mean, if I tell you that somebody bought 33 tons in a month, that's 400 tons a year, that's 10% of the gold, then you start getting the sense of why 4,000 is important. Uh, Turkey, about 44 tons. My God, that's 
If you annualize that, they bought over 12% uh, of the gold. Now, but here's the most important ch uh, chart. Obviously, <coughs> some switch was turned on in China in the last 12 months. Because in the 12 months to August, they bought 161 tons in the, of, of 11. In the 12 months to August of this year, they bought 584 tons. So we have a difference here of 400 tons, call it. 400, 4,000, get it? They bought 10% of the world's gold supply more than the previous year. What if I told you they bought 10% of the world's oil supply more than the previous year, or 10% of the world's wheat supply? Would you get it? And the only data point we have on China is because for some bizarre reason, Hong Kong announces their exports of gold through Hong Kong into China. Nobody announces what the, it goes to Beijing and directly from non-Hong Kong. They're, and I, when I last talked to the Royal Canadian Mint, I said, well, why do you ship your gold in there? Well, we ship it right to Beijing. But we don't get that data point because that would have to come from the People's Republic of China. This comes from the state of Hong Kong. But that's a massive change in policy. And why would they do that? You all know the reason why these non-Western banks do this. They see what the Western banks are doing. They're, my partner Rick Rule of Sprott USA said it best, when you have QE3, you're a counterfeiter. You're a counterfeiter. You're printing money that has nothing behind it. There is nothing behind it. Get used to it. Okay. Oh, let me just see where we, okay, so we got the 4,000 tons. By the way, the, the um, supply of gold has not gone up, <clears throat> excuse me, has not gone up in 13 years. And it may go down this year because mines are having such a big problem producing gold. And I'm not referring to the South African thing, I'm referring to, you know, Newmont struggling, Barrick struggling, Gold Corp struggling. They're all struggling, we all know that. So this, we've been flatlined here, okay? So we have all these supposed new people buying gold, supposed new people buying gold, there's no increase in the supply. Now let's look at that. Here are some of the data points that we use. So for example, even in mine supply, 224 tons of the increase comes out of China and Russia. China and Russia don't sell their gold in the free market. They consume their gold, so we just chop that off. Central banks used to sell 400 tons of gold. I'm sure this year they buy 600 tons of gold. There's a thousand ton change. I know we, we can see the data on US and uh, Canadian min sales. They, they're up by 36 tons a year uh, using a 12 data, a 12 forecast. ETFs, ETFs didn't even exist in 2000. Uh, they have a, a net change of 325 tons. In the month of September, one month, the ETFs changed by 100 tons. 100 a month, 1,200 a year, 1,200 on 4,000, you get it. Massive change. Chinese gold imports, I told you, Indian consumption from 2,000 up by 165 in industrial. I have pointed out 2,400 tons of net change in supply demand in a market where the supply never increased. Well, where the hell are they buying the gold from then? Who was buying gold in 2000 that isn't buying it today? Because it was in balance in 2000. In fact, I start with, there was a wonderful book written in 1998 by Frank Veneroso, where he theorized and proved reasonably well that the, even in 2000, there was a shortage of 1,600 tons of gold per year, supply versus demand. The demand exceeded supply. If you add that to the 2,400 tons, I could have 4,000 tons of shortage in an 8,000 ton market. So where the hell's the gold coming from? And of course, my assumption is that the central banks are supplying the gold to the market. Now, I can't prove it, and here's why I can't prove it. Because when you go to a central bank financial statement, under gold, they list the following, one line, gold. Gold and gold receivables. Now, receivable is when you lease the gold to a bullion bank, the bullion bank sells it to the Chinese, the Chinese stuck, stick it away somewhere, but the central bank pretends that they can call upon the bullion bank to get the gold back. But they sold it. They're not backable. 
And that's why they put this line, gold and gold receivables. So we don't know how much physical gold they have and how much has been leased out. But I suspect with this kind of analysis, we must conclude that the, the uh, Western banks have continued to sell their gold. And don't we find it interesting that all the banks that are buying gold are all non-Western banks? Why is that? Why no Western bank? Why not the Swiss? Why not the Germans? Why not the French? Why not the English? Why not the Canadians? Why not the US? No. All the non-G6 guys. You know why? Because they see what's going on in the G6. Anybody looking at the G6 would think those guys are out of control. Printing money. Printing money. Okay, I don't have a lot of time left, but I want to talk about silver. I had a compendium of things that I wrote about gold in the last decade, and I put them all together, and there was a little book called Gold Investment of the Decade. One of the few guys to project that ahead of time was Rob McEwen. And I have said that I hope at the end of this decade, I'll put together a compendium of all the things I've written on silver, and I'll title that Silver Investment of the Decade. Why do I think it'll be Investment of the Decade? I'm a supply-demand guy, okay? By the way, it's interesting, even though I'm a supply-demand guy, and I thought this, there was a shortage when I start, first started buying it. In my dreams, I never believed we'd be printing money eight years later and we'd have bank runs in Europe 10 years later. Bank runs, we have bank runs going on. You must know that. The money's fleeing the Greek bank system, fleeing the, the Spanish bank system. Undoubtedly, it's fleeing the Iranian banking system as we speak today, where their currency just went down 40% in the week. And if they would have owned gold, they wouldn't have lost a cent. Every goddamn Iranian, if they would have owned gold, they wouldn't have lost a cent. And every Argentinian wouldn't have lost anything if they would have owned gold. And those of you who believe in fiat currencies, if it goes down and you don't own gold, you have no one but yourself to blame. Same with uh, Iceland. They got blown out. If you would have owned gold, you wouldn't have lost the 60%. If you want to trust your governments and your central bankers, you go right ahead. But we've seen lots of evidence that are not to be trusted. Okay, so there's the silver supply. That's, I think, mine supply. I use a number of 900 million when I talk about silver just out of interest. So I do the same analysis, but I do it from 05. And here are the changes. We actually increased mine supply, mint sales, U.S. Uh, Central Fund of Canada buying uh, the silver, China, the change in China, and the change, what's that? Oh yeah, you, the USA used to sell 100 million ounces a year for 40 years because they had 4 billion ounces of silver. They stopped selling it in about 05 or so, 06 or 07. So I got a 319 million ounce change in a 900 million ounce market, and I've included the increase in the supply from the mines. Well, how the hell can that go on? And in all this analysis, by the way, this is just six things. I don't see me in there buying all that silver that I bought back in 2001. I don't see any silver that anybody bought. I don't see, for example, any of the gold that Green, David Einhorn bought or that uh, University of Texas bought or that I bought for my funds. None of that's in the data because I have to go to public sources to get this. I got no gold bought by Russian billionaires, by Saudi sheiks. I don't have the data. Now, if you think those guys bought less gold in 2012 than 2000, you go ahead and believe it. And they're not in my numbers. Okay. I don't care about that. Here's what I care about. No, I don't even care about that. Well, it used to historically trade at a 16 to 1 ratio. It trades at about 52 or 3 to 1. There's, what I want to tell you is, and I would love you all to go to the, uh, the U.S. Mint website. There is a website that the U.S. Mint has where it shows you gold and silver sales. Look at it yourself, and you will find out a very interesting data point. The dollar value of silver sales last year was equal to the dollar value of gold sales. Okay, well if the price is 50 to 1, that means people bought 50 times more silver than gold. 50. 50 times more. 
When our silver trust does an issue and a gold trust does an issue, we raise 250 million in both of them. We buy 50 times more silver than gold. But the amount of gold available to purchase every year is 80 million ounces. The amount available of silver for investment is 450 million. Let's call it a ratio of 61. So for every ounce of gold bought, investors can buy six ounces of gold. Six. They buy 50. I was at a Brinks conference. I had an agent from uh, Canada and a dealer from the U.S. I said, well, what do you sell? Do you sell, what do you do in silver? I said, we sell more dollars of silver than gold. Independent survey. Gold money, an internet site that deals internationally, sell as many dollars of silver as gold. 50 times more. I will guarantee you, the world cannot buy 50 times more silver than gold. And the availability of inventory in the world of gold versus silver. All the gold in the world times $1,700.70 and all the silver inventory in the world, the ratio is 150 times more gold than silver in dollar. 150 times more. Even if, I even saw an article where the electronic trading of silver and gold in, in, in India, they were buying more silver. And the article went on to say they thought they would start buying silver in India. They're already traded equally. Even on the, um, even the SLV versus the GLD, it's about a four to one ratio, which is ridiculous. We have, for every $4 going into gold, we got $1 trading in the SLV, like the GLD versus the SLV. Well, there's no way that people can invest their money that way. So we've had a great wealth redistribution going on. And two of the beneficiaries of that are sitting in this room and they're, gonna, they're talking to you today. Because I very well remember buying gold in 2000. And stocks in 2000. And uh, Rob McEwen ran a company in 2000. That probably went up more than this. Way more than that. But the UE Gold Index has gone up 1600% in 13 years. 1600. What the hell have the other indices done? next to nothing. There's a lot of wealth has already been redistributed. Already. Oh, this is just gold versus all the other currencies. Okay. Uh, the message is don't trust the currencies. Don't trust the government data. Use your common sense. You got to own gold and silver. And my preference is silver. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now, if you, if you have a question for Eric Strutt, please put up your hand and the microphone will come straight across to you. You're scared of death. Maybe. There's one. Can we get a microphone down here, please? And just wait for the microphone so the internet viewers can hear the question. Um, Eric, I was just uh, curious. Uh, regarding uh, the London uh, Metals Exchange, and uh, we've been hearing sort of through the alternative media that there are delivery issues that uh, there's basically uh, undeclared flourish majeure, uh, can't get silver, um, and even allocated accounts that are supposed to be secure are, are questionable. Uh, can you comment? Sure. Well, Nick, I mean, I've, I've heard all those things and I've read all those things, and I've heard stories from people in the business. In fact, I mean, I can only, I can tell my own story that when we first launched the Silver Trust, I went out and theoretically bought uh, whatever it was, 20 million ounces of silver. And it took us three months to get delivery. And some of the silver was produced after the day I'd, after the time I'd purchased it. So in other words, it wasn't sitting in inventory. There's not some big inventory of silver sitting around. And I've heard many stories about people when you have a gold bar, it has a number on it. For example, in our gold trust, every bar is numbered. So we know what we have in our gold trust. Um, and the people would say, well, I've got the bar numbers. Can you deliver my bars to me? And of course, when they asked for delivery, they wouldn't get those bars. They'd get different bars. And the guy, you'd wonder, well, why the hell are they not giving me my bars? And uh, you may know that um, I think it was Morgan Stanley was sued successfully. I'm not sure which year it was, but it was probably in the last five or six years because they charged 
um, storage fees on gold to their customers who will theoretically own gold at, at uh, Morgan Stanley. And they lost the suit because it was uh, determined that they didn't have any gold. They gave a guy a certificate saying he had gold and they charged him to store the gold, but there was no gold. And um, while I'm at it, JP Morgan and HSBC are being sued for manipulating the price of gold and two, uh, sorry, of silver in 2008. That you, the court documents are available. We don't know what the result of that will be, uh, but there seems to be a strong case that maybe there has been manipulation. So yes, I hear about the London Bullion Exchange having some difficulties. I've always hoped that in doing the uh, gold trust issues and the silver trust issues that I can report to you someday that I didn't get the last bar. And I will let you know loud and clear when that happens. Sure. Uh, we've uh, uh, heard of the 16 to 1 gold to silver ratio uh, 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 thrown around a lot. Uh, is there any economic reason for that ratio or is it just a some sort of relic from history? Well, I actually had a chart on it which I jumped over. Uh, well, there's the historical, there's the in situ. So theoretically in the ground, there's 17 and a half times more silver in the ground. Um, it's, I don't know why, probably because that was, if it's 16 to one in the ground, that's probably what they mined and that's what they determined at the time. And I suspect it could easily go to that. In fact, sometimes I'm asked at these functions, well, if there's so many buyers of silver, why doesn't it trade at the same price of gold? <laughs> um, well, I know what would happen. I mean, if the price of silver went up, a lot of people would start buying gold instead of silver. But uh, I actually think that it will go back to 16 to 1. And I think it'll, go, it'll overshoot and maybe might even get back down to 10 to 1. But even if it's, even if it's uh, just to follow up, even if it's 16 to 1 in the ground, yes. uh, we all know that it's like an economic thing to mine it out of the ground. And if it's 50 to 1 economically, uh, why would it be 16 to 1 okay. uh, coming out of the ground? Well, let's put it this way. We, might, we mine a 900 million ounces of silver, we mine uh, 90 million ounces of gold. So we're producing 10 ounces of, of silver for every ounce of gold today. And it's not hard, it's, it's not easy to find silver. There's very few primary silver mines. They're mostly byproducts of either gold mining or lead zinc mining. So the, trust me, as a guy who invests in silver companies, you, there's not a wide variety of silver companies to invest in. It's a tough thing to find and tough to produce. So I think there is way more of a scarcity factor than I don't think 50 to 1 is reasonable whatsoever based on how you find it and how, how much it costs to produce it. So We have one more question before we break for dinner. I believe it's just at the back there. Yeah, uh, I'm just curious. Uh, have you figured out what um, what these non-G7 central banks are doing uh, to buy the precious metals, gold and silver? Are they uh, exchanging their their U.S. government bonds, or are they printing money? What are they doing? No, I guess all of them have. You know, you have to uh, gold trades in U.S. dollars. So if you buy it from someone you got to pay them U.S. dollars. So they're either taking their trade surplus and paying with that, or uh, converting their own currency to U.S. dollars and paying with that, but they're, they're basically di diversifying their, um, their foreign reserves and saying, well, as part of my foreign reserves, I want gold as well as I might want U.S. dollars and euros or yen or things like that. So it's just, it's a diversification issue. Like why don't, maybe it's wiser to own gold than paper currencies. And it took them an awful long time to figure it out when Rob McEwen knew about it in 2000, okay? I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you.